Hello, we are going to start talking about European colonial rule in Africa. Uh, how the system was established and what it was intended to do. Um, not, well, not, not one of our more fun topics, of course. Anyway, uh, but we got to do it. So here we go. Reminder once again, um, by about 1880, we're looking at a continent that looks like this, mostly uh, controlled and ruled over by Africans. I know, shocking, right? But by 1914, it was totally different. Uh, you only have one place on the continent not controlled by outsiders, and that's Ethiopia. Okay? The entire rest of the continent, even if it wasn't totally controlled by Europeans, certainly was carved up and, um, and claimed by them. Uh, and then control would be established over, over a period of time. Um, some general points here, and I'll get into some of these in, in more detail. Um, first thing to remember is, as we go back to that, uh, that map there, you see all these lines drawn, okay? And a lot of these are the same borders of, of the independent countries today. These were drawn by Europeans, um, not sitting at a map in Europe, but actually on the ground here in Africa. But they're totally artificial. These are artificial territories in the sense that a lot of times these lines, they don't represent anything. I mean, they, they, don't, uh, they don't recognize uh, pre-colonial states. They don't recognize uh, ethnic groups or anything. Um, very common, almost every case actually, these lines divided people, uh, divided communities uh, who should have been together. Um, at the same time, they combined disparate peoples together, which has caused a lot of conflict in, in, in current contemporary Africa. Um, and just generally were drawn to at the whim of, of Europeans. Um, at the same time, there's a distinct differences between coastal and interior areas. As you see, you know, Africa is a, a lot of Africa is a, is a landlocked continent. Um, and you're going to see a lot of these territories, uh, you know, they split up the coastline here, but significant parts of these territories are far in the interior. And it's going to be a, a different historical experience than for people who are near the coast as opposed to people who are in the interior. Something that Gorer talks about in his reading. I hope you got to read that already. I'll mention it probably a dozen times in this short lecture today because um, it's really a, that that reading is not really long but it really illustrates a lot of important points okay um, secondly colonial states are police states there's no two ways about it it's it, you know they, they obviously the conquest is done uh, based on military force but rule is based on military force as well it's just the threat of force by Europeans and their armies that keeps things going, um, you know, and, and once again, Gorer talks about this. He talks about uh, the role of the police in, in tax collection and enforcement. Uh, and he talks about how the police and soldiers were drawn in, in, in French West Africa anyway from, from certain ethnic groups. And then they were used against different groups. So, um, you know, the, the, remember the European colonizers had been colonizing different parts of the world for several hundred years at this point. They have, they literally have a colonizer playbook, you know, uh, you come in, you divide, you conquer people, you keep them separated, um, as a means of control. And of course, finally, all of this is grounded in racism. This is Europeans saying Africans are, you know, immature children who can't run their own affairs. So we have to step in and do it for them. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's BS of course. Um, but that's, that's, you know, what, what this is grounded in, um, you know, and, in, and including the, the French idea of assimilation, you know, they, they take over these territories and then they want to turn the Africans into black Frenchmen. And that was a process or a policy anyway, called assimilation. You know, if you start speaking French and become Catholic and, you know, um, uh, do various things, then you can, then, you know, you can become an assimilated African, but still, you know, still in their eyes, not as, not as good as, as the Europeans, of course. All right. So we got to keep in mind, once again, all this is, is grounded very much in racism. Okay. Um, one other important distinction to talk about, uh, 
is settler versus non-settler colonies. There are going to be Europeans everywhere, although not in large numbers usually. Um, but the important thing is there are going to be certain colonies which are established as settler colonies. Which What does that mean? That means large numbers of European settlers. And these are those territories. Out of some 55 territories in Africa, that's only seven or eight or so. Algeria, Kenya, southern Rhodesia, South Africa, Angola, and Mozambique are the major examples here. Um, these territories, for Africans who find themselves in a settler colony, their experience is going to be very much worse. Okay? Gorer is talking mostly about places which are not settler colonies, and it's still pretty bad. But settler colonies are worse because, of course, large numbers of white settlers come in, and the first thing they're going to do is take away Africans' land. And it's, well, certain parallels with uh, European immigration and westward expansion in the United States, right? Move Settlers move out west, and what do they do? They take native land away. Um, same sort of thing here. And so the Africans in settler colonies are going to be reduced to being laborers or living in certain uh, reservations, kind of like, you know, the Navajo or uh, so on. So um, the experience of settler colonies is, is going to be much worse. And, uh, you know, so for people in settler colonies, uh, life is going to be worse. And every one of these territories, everyone is going to have a violent route to independence because the settlers don't want to let go, okay? So it's going to be a lot more suffering and a lot more violence in those places. All right, um, <clears throat> point I made about Scramble for Africa was, was to say, Europeans didn't really conquer African territory for economic reasons. However, once they conquered it, they most certainly had economic motivations. They wanted these territories to pay for themselves. The European taxpayers back home didn't want to pay for them, so the territories had to pay for themselves. So they started by setting up systems to extract wealth. Okay? Um, I should probably reverse these. The first thing they do then is introduce taxation. Once again, Gorer, right, has a very good discussion about this in French West Africa. Um, one of the first uh, taxes to be introduced, <clears throat> at least in British territories, is what was called the hut tax or the yard tax. Okay? Um, pretty much what it sounds like. Go through, count the number of dwellings, and, and tax people based on that. But Africans res could resist that pretty easily. Uh, they would move, they would combine, you know, combine together in, 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 in um, larger uh, houses and so on. So, it was fairly easily avoided. So that was typically replaced with what was called the head tax or the poll tax. Okay. And this is what Gorer once again talks about capitation. Okay. Like capital. This is a head tax. It's in French territories. In, in uh, British territories, they called it a poll tax. It has nothing to do with voting because they didn't allow voting. Um, it's just a tax on an individual. Okay. In, uh, in Swahili, uh, in East Africa, it was called Kodi ya kichwa, tax of the head. Uh, kichwa means head in Swahili. So um, it's a tax on individuals. And the purpose of taxation is really twofold. Yes, it's to raise money for government, absolutely. But secondly, it's basically to force people to work, to, to mobilize labor. And, you know, there's a gender dimension here. Most taxes are directly on men. Gorer talks about cases that they're not. But uh, most taxes are on men. Well, first off, because Europeans are sexist as well as racist, right? And they think men are the head of the household. Um, but also, they, they mostly want to mobilize men to work. So they're going to tax men. All right. In addition to taxation, as Gorer also talks about, you had forced labor. Um, in the British system, that's usually for public works projects like roads. Uh, in the, the British system, as you say, the French system, it was a, a longer lasting thing. The British system, once they established roads, like the first decade or so, for the most part, forced labor um, was eliminated. But the French system, it continued on, and Africans hated it. You know, you're being forced to work for like a month, a year, with no pay. Well, who wouldn't hate that, right? 
Um, and as Gorer talks about, a lot of times it, it's happening during the rainy season when you need to be in your fields. So um, it was a hated feature in, in, in French systems, especially in West Africa. And it caused a lot of Africans to leave French territories and, and try to migrate to British territories. Because uh, the British system was, well, it could be bad, but it was a little more benign, at least in this regard. Okay, now, imagine you are an African subsistence farmer. And now, some guy, who looks like me, frankly, comes in and says, you need to start paying taxes, right? And you say, what are taxes? <laughs> and they explain it to you. And then they say, furthermore, you have to pay in money, in currency. And you're a subsistence farmer, and you're not, of course, don't have British coins on you. And you say, what, what's coins? Well, the other thing that, of course, the Europeans are going to do is introduce currencies in various places. Um, well, how can a subsistence farmer raise the money needed to pay their taxes? Well, most African farmers, if you're a farmer, you're going to grow something, right? Okay. But you have to sell it then in order to earn the money to pay your taxes. And you can only sell a product if there's a market for it. And the Europeans, of course, are controlling the markets. So they can determine largely what gets grown in any one territory. And usually it's something that they want back home, like palm oil or cocoa or peanuts or whatever it might be, cotton. Um, okay. Now, for the subsistence farmer then, you, what you have to do, instead of just growing food crops, you have to grow other crops as well. And these are known as cash crops. Right? The cash crop system gets started. Right? Now, the problem is, being a subsistence farmer, you pretty much are using all your land and all your labor to grow food. Now, you can't. You have to take some of your land and some of your labor and some of your time and grow cash crops. Right? What does that mean? Well, it means you're growing less food, right? Now, if you get a good price for your crops, then you can afford to buy food. Okay? But you can't count on that because prices are set on global markets or they're set by the European colonial power. Um, usually what happens in a lot of areas then is you end up with this gender differentiation in agriculture. Because men are being taxed directly, they're the ones then who are going to be growing cash crops. Women, less likely to be taxed, are going to be responsible for food crops. Um, but that, incre that increases unequal power relationships within the household because it's the men who are going to control the money. And women are going to be sidelined from the cash economy. And that's going to have repercussions down the road. Okay? In addition to which, in these early colonial systems, uh, there's going to be a huge increase in malnutrition. Why? Because people are spending their time and energy growing cash crops and not food crops. Right? So the Europeans, on one hand, go back to the white man's burden, are claiming they're coming here to eliminate famine and so on. And they're actually causing more um, because of this economic control system that they have. Okay. Now, if you... And once again, Gorrera talks about this. Let's say you're living in, a, in an area, you know, and he talks about, he, he refers to it as the Sudan, but it's this area, say, of Upper Volta. We see the word Sudan right there on this map, right? Um, well, there's nothing you can grow up there. Um, there's nothing you can grow up there that the French want. And the transport cost to get that to the coast would eat up any of your profits anyway. So as Guerrero talks about, what you have is labor migration. You have people in these areas who are being taxed. They can't, they can't produce the crops and stuff they need. So they have to move somewhere where they can either grow crops or work on a plantation or something like that and grow the things that people need. And a lot of that migration then is going to be men because, once again, men are being taxed. Uh, so you have a, a lot of villages left with just women, children, and the elderly and the men gone for a significant portion of the year working to earn the money to pay taxes. Okay, that's true in agriculture, as Gorrera tells us. It's especially true in mining. 
We're going to see mining operations, especially in Central and Southern Africa, these shaded areas here. Um, and you see, well, you see copper, copper, uh, gold, diamonds, gold, and so on. Um, these mines, as we'll talk about next week also, are going to use hundreds of thousands of workers. And there's not enough people in one area, so they're going to bring people from other places. And that's going to be migrant labor systems. Okay? Just like we have migrant labor in the U.S., mostly for agricultural work. Here, though, it's going to be for mining. Um, so these economic systems in the colonial period are going to change life entirely for people across the continent. And for the most part, not in a good way. Okay. Okay. Let's shift over to talk about some political systems and so on. There are major differences in how European powers approached setting up political systems in these new colonies. Okay. For the British, they tended to treat each colony as an independent entity. Let me go back to the other map for just a minute. All right. So. The uh, the British in, on here are in red, okay? So Sierra Leone was ruled as one colony, and Gold Coast was one, and Nigeria was one, and so on. Uganda, British East Africa, also known as Kenya, and so on, okay? The French did it a little differently. They grouped their territories in these larger um, units. So all of West Africa was known as French West Africa, and it's all these territories here. And then French territories here are French Equatorial Africa, or French, near, uh, French Africa near the equator. All right. And then Algeria up here was separate because it's the major French settler colony, and Madagascar down here also, also separate. Um, so in French West Africa, and again, we see this in Gros Rare, everything is kind of ruled from the governor general in Dakar. And he decides everything for French West Africa. In the British territories, each territory is going to have their own governor. Okay? And he's going to be responsible for what happens in that territory. Which means for the French people or Africans living in French territories, their experience is going to be rather more uniform. Right, because there's basically only two guys in charge saying what happens. British territories, there's going to be a lot more variation in African experience. What happens in Ghana will be different than Nigeria, which will be different than Sierra Leone, um, just because you get different people in charge and different policies and so on. Okay. Um, anyway, now one of the things that is common, and I and I disagree with your textbook about this is a system of indirect rule, okay? The fact is, and your textbook attributes this to the British, and they talk about this as a British system of doing things. Well, that's not true. It's actually the way everyone ruled over these territories. You don't have that many Europeans in here. When the Germans took over Rwanda, for example, um, they had three, three Europeans, okay? <laughs> um, so, so they set up a system of indirect rule, which is ruling through, quote unquote, traditional African authorities. In some cases, they were really traditional African authorities. It might be Africans who were already there. The kingdom of, um, of uh, Buganda, for example, and, you, and what becomes Uganda. The British come in and they tell the king what to do. And then he transmits those orders through his officials who were already in place. All right. Um, but you see this in the Gore reading as well. Okay, the governor general in Dakar transmits orders to the districts. The head of the district then tells that to the chiefs of Canton, and those are all Europeans then. And then they transmit those messages from them down to the village chiefs, and those are Africans. Um, so it's also indirect rule. You don't have Europeans in every village, right? You, co you couldn't. Um, there's not enough of them, it's too expensive, and so on. So they end up ruling through African authorities. Um, and that works well, especially in centralized states like Buganda and the Sokoto Caliphate and places like that. You know, uh, but what about not every, not every African society, though, had a centralized state? The Igbo, for example, in, in, in what is it, say Eastern Nigeria, they, they were just village-level societies. You know, every, every village was its own state. 
essentially, you know, like Greek city states. Uh, and they rule through councils. Okay. Well, that's that's too cumbersome for the British to, to worry about. So what they're going to do, they're going to go in and just appoint somebody in charge. They're going to say, you, you're the chief. Okay, we're going to, you know, you're, you're in charge now. Um, and that's what Gorer shows you also in French West Africa anyway. Everything comes down on the heads of these chiefs. You know, it's not easy being in charge um, because the Europeans are going to continue to make demands of you. You're the one who's responsible for make, mobilizing labor. Okay, making sure people turn out in forced labor schemes. You're the one who's responsible for the tax collection. If things are short, it's coming out of your pocket. Okay, um, so you know, being a chief was was not an easy job. You know, I, and I think some people do it though because they want to try to be a buffer between the Europeans and and their people. So I understand that some people do it because they're corrupt and they it's the best way to you know skim off some money. Um, but uh, but it was a difficult situation, no matter what you did. Um, once again, you know these are these are you know um, uh, these are police states, you know, and, and and it's the threat of it's it's the use of violence and the threat of violence that keeps everything in order. Because you ask yourself, how can you know how can you know the three German guys in Rwanda rule this territory of hundreds of thousands of people? Well, it's it's the threat of force, right? And that's something else you see in Gorea. You know, the, the Europeans are going to appoint people um, as police, and they're going to work on behalf of the Europeans. Now, early in the colonial period, um, a lot of those early soldiers or police were slaves. Uh, they're people who were enslaved. And the Europeans will give them their freedom if they become soldiers. Well, they're enslaved in an area that they didn't come from, so they don't have any ties to these local people. That's, you know, so that explains why they would cooperate with the system, right? Um, and so, uh, yeah, no, this is this is a picture from, from colonial Kenya, and you do see, obviously, a couple of white guys there, and you definitely had Europeans um, in charge of the police and the military and so on. Um, but for the most part, the, the majority of the police and military are going to be Africans, but they'll be Africans usually from outside the area where they're doing the policing, right? It'd be like, you know, putting Packers fans as head of the police in Chicago or something, you know? Um, now, Africans, as I mentioned last time during the, the scramble for Africa, they resisted the scramble for Africa and some places held out for, you know, a couple of decades. Uh, but they would ultimately, in every case except Ethiopia, be conquered. That doesn't mean that that they gave up, though. Um, you know, they were defeated in most cases by about 1900. Then the Europeans put these systems in place. And it was, it's interesting because across the continent in the next couple of decades, once Africans realized how bad colonial rule was going to be, because they're suffering from malnutrition, right? They can't produce enough food. They're being forced into labor and so on like that. They're losing their land if they're in a settler colony. So there's going to be uprisings. There's going to be resistance and there's going to be rebellions, uh, some, some very large, the Maji Maji Rebellion. In German territory, in German German East Africa or, or Tanganyika, what is today Tanzania, is going to be huge. Uh, there's also going to be uprising in German Southwest Africa. The Germans were pretty brutal, frankly, so I understand why there's more uprisings there. The Herero Nama uprisings in 1904 and 1907, which the Germans in both cases responded with incredible brutality. And actually, the first genocide of the of the 20th century was was German efforts to wipe out the Herero and Nama people in Southwest Africa. They, they, and they were explicit about it. They're like, we're going we're gonna to wipe these people out and we're going to kill everybody. Um, and then, but, but in British territories too, in, in Yasalan, which becomes Malawi, um, John Chalimboy uh, led an uprising in 1915, uh, primarily against British efforts to force Africans to fight in World War I, because they were, they were drafting Africans, forcing them to fight. And, uh, um, and it's, that's an interesting case, both historically, the way he, he, he was educated by the American missionaries and he was inspired by John Brown. I don't know if you know, remember John Brown at Harper's Ferry. He tried to lead uh, an uprising of um, uh, enslaved African Americans just before the Civil War in, in the U.S. And John Chalimboy took that as his inspiration and led an uprising in, in Malawi. Um, 
but also interesting because uh, just recently the British erected a statue of John Chalembe in London. Um, so it's a way of recognizing, you know, something of their colonial past. Uh, anyway, so Africans continued to resist. They resisted in ways small and large. You know, they would resist tax collection, as I mentioned. Uh, they would resist going to work. They would resist forced labor. But in sometimes big ways, such as, such as uh, uprisings and rebellions as well. Um, well. This shows you just the area of the Maji Maji Rebellion. Uh, Almost half of the territory of German East Africa, tens of thousands of people took part in this, this uprising, um, which is indicative of how bad colonial rule was in that territory. Um, okay, then. That's what I wanted to talk about. We'll talk about more about colonial rule next week. Uh, we're going to look at a settler colony, specifically in South Africa, and then we're going to look at some other issues then um, on another day. All right. Thank you.